يسر لنا أمورنا وأحل العقدة من ألسنتنا يفقه الغير قولنا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ما شاء الله um, first and foremost إن شاء الله I would like to welcome our Sheikh uh, Sheikh Yahya Rabi to Masjid al-Rahman on behalf of the com- committee and uh, our chairman Sheikh uh, Abdul Wahab and our Imam Sheikh Abdul Salam I would like to welcome Sheikh Yahya on our, in our Masjid Masjid al-Rahman and Sheikh this is my locality this is my Masjid Wallahi alhamdulillah Uh, after that, I would like to welcome you all, inshallah. Uh, and I see, mashallah, any, these uh, faces, most of us are youth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. So, inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll start our speech, inshallah. We'll give our sheikh uh, his time to start the speech. And inshallah, after the lecture, we'll have a session for Q&A, for questions. Uh, and the topic, inshallah, will be Nabi Allah Yusuf alayhi salam from prison to power. Wa nasallallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala and yuffiqana shaykhana ila ma fihi al-khayr wa salah, inshallah. Fali tafadhal mashkuran majura. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء وإمام المرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقائدنا وقرة عيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين وأصحابه الغلل ما من أفضل الصلاة والسلام التسليم After praising Allah جل في علاه and sending salutations upon our messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم will proceed and Alhamdulillah that Allah عز وجل has gathered us here this evening I'm extremely glad to be here to see all your radiant wonderful faces in the house of Allah عز وجل and I ask Allah تبارك وتعالى to make this a blessed gathering and I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to make us from those who are forgiven in this gathering. And I ask Allah Jalla fi ula to make us from those who hear this speech and follow the best of it. And I ask Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala just like he gathered us here this evening that he gathers us in Jannah to the those and a'la innahu li thalik al-qadr ali. Since I've come to Kenya, I've been told that I speak too fast. So, am I speaking too fast? Should I slow down, huh? Should I slow down? The reason why I speak fast it is, I have a lot to say and there's very little time. So I try to get a lot done in the short period of time that we have. But I will try to speak as slow as I can so that everyone can understand what I am saying. Ayyuhal kiram, we're reciting in Salat al-Maghrib, Surah Yusuf. Surah Yusuf, Allah Azza wa described it as the best story. This surah, Allah Azza wa he starts it with Alif Lam Ra. Tilka ayatul kitab al Allah starts it with Alif Lam Ra. What does Alif Lam Ra mean? Huh? Anyone know what it means? No one. No one knows. Does, does it have a purpose? Alif Lam Ra. Huh? Only Allah knows the meaning. But does it have a purpose? Nothing in the Quran is purposeless. Everything has a purpose. The purpose of these huruf al muqatta'a these letters that Allah starts some suwar with, like Alif Lam Mim, Alif Lam Ra, Taha, Kaf Ha Ya Ain Sad, Noon, Qaf, Sad, Hamim, Hamim, Ain, Sin, Qaf, etc. All of these letters, they serve the purpose of challenging the Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula at that time and everyone who's to come after them. Allah Ta'ala, He is revealing these letters. The Arabs of Quraysh, they heard these letters. They heard Alif Lam Ra. And then they know what these letters are, Alif Lam Ra, but they don't know what it means. 
What is Allah Azza wa saying to them? Allah Azza wa Ta'ala is saying to them that this Quran, it is made up of these letters that you know very well. And despite that, you cannot produce anything like this Quran. It is indicating the miracle of the Quran that it is truly from Allah Jalla fi ula. Because Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, He says, قُلْ لَئِنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لا يأتون بمثله ولو كان بعضهم لبعض ظهيرا الله says if all of mankind and jinn kind they came together to produce something like this Quran they will never be able to do so even if they all aided each other in doing so because it's truly from Allah Azza wa Jal and then after that, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiyyan la'allakum ta'qilun." We have revealed it as the Arabic Quran, so that you can reason, so that you can comprehend, so that you can understand. Quran is in Arabic. In order for one to truly understand the Quran correctly, properly, they need to understand it in its actual language, the Arabic language. The, no matter how much you read the translation of the Quran you will not be able to understand the Quran properly because the translation is always going to fall short. Arabic is an extremely rich language and that's why Allah chose Arabic as the language of the Quran. But do you know that Arabic is the language of every single one of you right now? It's the language of the Muslims, not the Arabs. Allah chose this language for the Muslims. That's why Ibn Khaldun, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his book, The Muqaddimah, when he talks about the Muslims, he refers refers to them as the, as the Arabs. You know why? Because all the Muslims at that time, previously, they spoke Arabic and they considered one who spoke Arabic an Arab, even though they were not ethnically Arab. Because Allah chose this language for the Muslims. Because Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ We have not sent a messenger except with the language, the tongue of his people to clarify to them. Who is the messenger sent to us? Muhammad What was his language? Arabic. Who is his ummah? Us. We is ummah. So that means that our language is Arabic because his language is Arabic. We was, he was sent to us. That means we are the people that we should be learning the Arabic language to understand our deen, to understand the speech of Allah, to understand the speech of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam. So Allah mentions that here. We have revealed it as the Arabic Quran so that you can comprehend, you can reason, you can understand. Allah ta'ala starts Surah Yusuf with highlighting to us the relationship between Yusuf السلام, and his father Yaqub. Yusuf السلام, and his father Yaqub, they had an exemplary relationship. Yusuf السلام, he sees a dream. He's a young child. He sees a dream. He sees that these stars and the sun and the moon, that they are prostrating to him. He found this dream strange but despite he found it strange he had such a strong relationship with his father his relationship with his father was so good that they were so close to one another that Yusuf السلام, immediately he told and informed his father he did not hide anything from his father because he knows his father is a prophet of Allah he is one who he receives revelation from Allah he is one who has that knowledge that Allah has taught him therefore he seeks that knowledge from his father إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبتي إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لي ساجدين. He says, Oh my father, I have seen eleven stars who are prostrating to me, and the sun and the moon, they're all prostrating to me. His father, what did he say to Yusuf? He told him to not tell his dream to anyone, especially his brothers. Now this relationship that Ya'qub had with his son Yusuf, it's an example for us. Now this is the relationship that we need to have with our children. And this is the relationship that our children need to have with their parents. You need to befriend your children. 
It shouldn't be a relationship that is based on dictatorship. That you, uh, they, you, as soon as you walk into the house, the children, they fear you. They're scared of you. They can't come near you. They can't approach you. That's not a relationship that the father should have with his children. Because what happens where I come from in the West, and perhaps you have it here as well. The children, they live double lives because of the way their parents are. Because of their parents, the way they treat them, the children are not comfortable to share anything with their parents. They start hiding things from their parents. So when they're in the home, they are a different person to how they are outside. Don't make your children live double lives by treating them like they're your enemy, by treating them in such a harsh manner that they can't share anything with you, that they can't be close to you, they can't consult you, they can't seek advice from you because of the way you treat them. Make them feel comfortable. Don't lead your children to lie to you. A lot of parents, because of the way they treat their children, they cause their children to lie to them and to live a lie. Yaqub alayhi salam, he's extremely close to his son Yusuf. So Yusuf is very comfortable with his father, like a friend. He's able to share everything with him. So his father gives him the advice that he needs. He says, don't share your dream with your brothers. Strange. He tells him, don't share it with your brothers. His brothers are his blood. But despite that, he tells him, don't share it with his brothers. Why? Fayakidu lakakaydah. So that they plot against you. His own brothers will plot against him? Yes. This teaches us that envy and jealousy, it can come from the closest people to you. Those who are your blood, they can envy you and that can lead them to do or cause harm to you. Therefore, we are taught that our blessings, we do not expose them to everyone. Conceal your blessings. The blessings that are not necessary for you to share with others, do not share it with others to safeguard yourself and protect yourself from harm. That's the advice that Yaqub gave to Yusuf. And then he told him that Inna shaytan insani mubin. The shaytan, he is to man a great enemy. Shaytan is the one who causes these ill feelings between brothers. He's the ultimate enemy. And then he makes others who are close to your enemy as well. He is warning his son of the plot of shaitan and the plots of man as well. And that's how we need to be those who are cautious. We are not meant to be those who are just in ghafla heedless and walk around heedless without being cautious and careful when it comes to dealing with others. Jealousy is a real thing. It exists. Don't cause others to be jealous of you. And then when something happens to you, you blame them. Why do they do this to me? But because you exposed all your blessings to them, they did this to you. We live in a time where people love to expose the blessings that Allah has granted them. We live in an age of social media. Everything they are doing, they are posting. Their food, he has to take a picture. Where he sleeps, he has to take a picture. What car he's driving, he has to take a picture. His family, he takes a recording. He puts it all out there for everyone to see. How do you expect people not to envy you? When you are exposing and showing them everything, showcasing your life as if it's a film. That's not what Islam teaches. Islam teaches, yes, protect yourself, read your adhkar, be one who is connected to Allah, and be cautious, come with the necessary asbab, the means to safeguard yourself. And then, this envy and jealousy that the brothers of Yusuf salam, they felt, what did it lead to? Jealousy, it blinds an individual to the extent that they suggested to kill their own brother. It wasn't just a matter of just, you know, let's get rid of him, let's put him to a side, let's, let's do something as little to him. It was the ultimate. Shaitan took him the further step. Kill him. Do you see that when an individual, they follow their nafs and their evil desires, how far it can take them? Because the brothers Yusuf salam, they followed their evil desires. Shaitan will beautify for your evil, your evil desires to the extent that you act like an insane person. Something that you would never think of, he will make you think it's okay. But one of them had some sanity. He said, don't kill Yusuf. Rather, throw him into the well. That's how we're going to get rid of him. Yusuf salam. He was thrown into the well by his brothers. They came to his father and they said to Yaqub alayhi salam, قالوا, Ya abana malaka la ta'amanna ala Yusuf. 
وإنا له لناصحون. They said, O oh, our father, ما لك لا تأمنا على يوسف. تأمنا this word, this word, it has a ruling in Tadweed known as Ishmam. Ishmam, it is the word تأمنا, it has two nouns. Okay? The first noun has Dhamma and the second one has Fatha. It's originally تأمنونا. What's happened? The two nouns were merged with runna, with nasalation. But what does Ishmam do? Ishmam, it's a rule that you indicate with your lips the dhamma without making the sound. Right? So we do this. We indicate with our lips dhamma. But there's no sound. Okay? This rule of tajweed. Some of the ulama, they mention a latifa, a benefit regarding it. Which is that this rule is a rule that you see, but you cannot hear. Right? You see it, but you can't hear it. This portrays and demonstrates exactly the way the brothers of Yusuf salam they were. They came to their father and they're saying, why do you not trust us with Yusuf? They are showing something to their father and they're hiding something else within, a different intention. That rule of tajweed, it indicates that. It shows you that every single part of the Quran, nothing is random. It contributes to the meaning of the Quran. Even the way we recite the Quran, the rules of tajweed, contributes to the meaning of the Quran. So, even though Yaqub he was reluctant and he was hesitant, they managed to convince him to take him. And when they took him, they threw him into the well and they came back to their father and they said he was eaten by a wolf and so on. Right? طيب. Yusuf السلام, when he was thrown into the well, was he patient? When he was in the well, was he patient? Yes or no? Ah, he was patient. طيب. Down the line, Yusuf alayhi salam is taken, he is bought, he is taken by the Aziz eventually in Egypt. And he grows up in the house of the Aziz of Egypt, right? This powerful man. When he grows up, and he's a young man, Yusuf was given great beauty. He was given great beauty. Extremely handsome. Imra'atul Aziz, this woman who he grew up in her house, when he became a young man, who's extremely handsome, who looks very really beautiful. What did she do? She desired him. وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبَوَابِ وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبَوَابِ وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكَ قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَثْوَاي What did she do when he grew up? She tries to seduce him. And she locked the doors, Allah says. وَغَلَّقَتِ abwab. She locked the doors. It's not one door. Many doors. She locked them so that no one could get, come in. She shut them. It's very difficult. Even if someone wants to come in, it will take them a long time because they have to open one door after another, after another, after another. Right? And then she said, Hey, Talek, come on. Now, Yusuf, السلام, he's in a difficult situation. This woman... She has locked all the doors and they're alone and she's calling him to haram, to zina. Now, Yusuf السلام, he's a man. A man who's put in a situation like that is an extremely difficult situation to get out of. You will be tempted, right? But despite that, Yusuf السلام, he runs for his life. He runs towards the door. He says, Qala ma'ad Allah. He says, I seek refuge in Allah. He seeks Allah's protection. He seeks Allah to safeguard him. That's the first instinct that he had. Even though he perhaps had some desire. But despite that, he fought against it. And he sought Allah's protection. He ran towards the doors. And she chases him. And she rips his, 
his clothes. Now Yusuf السلام, when he was in that situation, was he patient or not? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. The patience that Yusuf السلام, he had when he was in the well and the patience that he had now with Imra'atul Aziz, which one is better? Huh? The first or the second? The second or the first? The first is the well. The second is in the house of Imratul Aziz. Who says the first? Raise your hand. Ah. Who says the second? The majority. Okay, those who say the second, why? Why is the second patience better? Why is that? Because he fought against his desires. Interesting. Good. You're on the right line, but that's not exactly what I'm looking for. This is the exact point I'm looking for. Any other answers? Why is the second one better? The second one is better, but why? Huh? No idea. Should I tell you? Okay, you don't want to know. We'll move on. Or you do want to know. Do you want to know? Okay. Uh, you have an answer. Huh? Because he sought Allah's protection. Excellent. MashaAllah. But the answer is, when Yusuf السلام, was in the well and he was patient, did he have any other choice but to be patient? Can he go anywhere? Can he do anything? He's stuck there, right? He has to be patient. But with Imra'atul Aziz, he has the choice to be patient and leave the haram or the choice to do the haram. Because he has the choice and he chose to be patient and refrain from haram, that patience is great in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal and it's more rewarding in the sight of Allah wa ta'ala. But this teaches us something that Yusuf alayhi salam, he was thrown into the well. He was patient. He was in the house of Imratul Aziz. He was patient. He was thrown into prison. He was patient, right? But out of all of them, out of all those tests that Yusuf السلام, went through, the most difficult test that he faced was that he faced was the fitna of women. And the Prophet والسلام, he warns us of that. He said that the greatest test that I have left behind for men of my ummah, it is the fitna of women. Don't go near them. Don't think that I'm safe. Don't think that I'm okay. Don't think that this won't happen to me. Don't think that I'm righteous. Because Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah says, what, what did Allah say about him? That she desired him and he also desired her. But look what Allah Azza wa says. Allah says like that. We divert from Yusuf السلام, all of immorality and evil. Why was that? Was Yusuf protected by Allah and that it was diverted from him? Because he's the one who initially took that step to Allah to seek protection. He said, Ma'ad Allah. He sought Allah's protection and he did what he can to protect himself. He ran away. So Allah Taala helped him with the rest. That's how we need to be. We need to be those who take the necessary steps to protect themselves and safeguard themselves from the haram. When you take the necessary steps to safeguard yourself from the haram, Allah Jalla fi ula will help you with the rest. Jazakallah khair. Allah Azza wa Jal will help you with the rest. But it depends on you taking that initial step. Showing Allah Ta'ala you're seeking His assistance and help. And then Allah Ta'ala promises you to help you. And then Allah says, Innahu min ibadina al mukhlasin. Innahu min ibadina al mukhlasin. Another riwayah. He says, Allah says that He is. One of the reasons why Yusuf السلام, was saved and protected, it is because he is from our sincere slaves. He was sincere. He had ikhlas. Allah protected him with his ikhlas. The more sincere you are, the more Allah will protect you. You do things for Allah's sake. Now after that happened, 
وقدت قميصه من دبر وألف يا سيدها لدى الباب. She, he ran to the door. She chased him. And she teared his shirt from behind. And her master came in, her husband came in, into the room. Now, what did she do? She tries to look innocent. قالت ما جزاء من أراد بأهلك سوءا. What is the punishment of the one who desired and wanted to do evil to your family, i.e. your wife? Except that he is imprisoned or that he is punished a severe punishment. Then Yusuf السلام, defends himself. She's the one who tries to seduce me. And then there was a witness that came. And he said, okay, we're going to look at the evidences that we have, the proofs that we have. If his shirt is teared from the front, then she's truthful and he's a liar. If his shirt is tied, is teared from behind, then he is truthful and she's the liar. They look at his shirt, it's ripped from behind and then they knew that Yusuf is innocent and she's the one who was the perpetrator, the one who tried to do all of this. So he said, Yusuf, أعرض عن هذا واستغفري لذنبك إنك كنت من الخاطئين. He said, Yusuf, turn away from her, from this. And he said to her, seek forgiveness from your Lord. Verily, you are a wrongdoer. You are guilty. Now, people heard in the city that Imra'atul Aziz, تراود فتاها عن نفسي, that she's trying to seduce the boy that grew up in her house. Her reputation has been damaged. So, when these women are spreading these rumors about her, she plots. She wants them to realize that they would have been the exact same if they were in her situation. So, what does she do? She gathers all the women, she gets them to cut meat and so on. And then she tells Yusuf, they have knives. And she tells Yusuf to come out. When he comes out, what do they do? They were not cutting the meat. They were so in such awe, staring at Yusuf السلام, that they even lost the feeling in their bodies. They started cutting their own hands. Imagine cutting your own hands. That's insane. And they don't feel it. They said that this is not a human. It's not human. They said, he must be a noble angel. And then Imratul Aziz now said, you see, I told you, you guys would have done the exact same thing if you were in my house. So now all these women are after Yusuf Alayhi Salaam. Yusuf Alayhi Salaam, he went to prison, right? Do you know why he went to prison? Huh? Do you know why he went to prison? Huh? Who knows? Any idea? No one. The reason why Yusuf, ah, oh, someone knows, someone, yes. Huh? Sorry? I can't hear you. Because he was framed by the lady. Not quite. He didn't have to go to prison. But the reason why he actually went to prison is because Yusuf السلام, chose it. He chose prison. He said, My Lord, prison is more beloved to me than that which I'm calling me to. So because he said that, Yusuf السلام, was granted prison by Allah. But that prison, when he went to prison, Yusuf السلام, he didn't live a life of misery and sorrow in prison. He didn't despair. In that prison, he met two men. These two men, So what did they say to him? They told him their dreams and then they said to him, interpret it for us. How do they end their statement? We see you as from those who do good. They said that to him when he's in prison. When he's in prison, Yusuf is he's using it as an opportunity to call to Allah Azza wa to teach people about Allah and the oneness of Allah. He's serving the religion of Allah even in prison. His work does not stop 
in prison. And that shows us, that it teaches us a lesson that the believer, wherever he's placed nafa, he's beneficial. Wherever the believer is placed, wherever the situation is put in, he is meant to be beneficial. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he said, he said, the believer is like the bee. He said, لا تأكل إلا طيبة ولا تضع إلا طيبة. He does not consume except that which is pure, and he does not produce except that which is pure. يعني everything the believer takes in is pure. Everything he produces is pure, is beneficial. And he عليه الصلاة والسلام he said another hadith, المؤمن كنخلة. So the believer is like the date tree, the palm tree. You know why he said that? Because the palm tree, every single part of it is beneficial. Nothing is thrown away. Everything can be used. يعني the believer, every single part of him should be beneficial. Benefit others like that. So Yusuf Ali Salam, he's in the prison, prison, and he's benefiting others. And because of this role that he's playing in the prison of being beneficial and teaching the people and so on, that is what ultimately leads him to exiting the prison and leaving the prison. Yusuf Ali Salam, because I don't have much time, I'm going to skip certain parts of the story. Okay, you guys know the story, right? You know the story. I'm going to skip certain parts of the story so that. I can extract certain benefits and we benefit from the time that we have. Yusuf Ali Salam eventually comes out of the story. He comes out of prison due to the dream of the king and he interprets it for him and so on. And then later on what happens, the, the king makes him one of his close allies and then Yusuf Ali Salam, what does he say? قَالَ جَعَلْنِي عَلَى خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ He said, make me the treasurer. I am one who is trustworthy, who can be trusted and I'm well-knowing. I have knowledge and so on. I'm going to take care of it and so on. You know what this teaches us? It teaches us something very important. That if you are someone who is qualified for a position, if you are someone who has the qualification, the knowledge, the experience for a certain position, it is upon you and it is your responsibility to say that you are qualified. Some people is that you stay quiet, you don't put that prophet humble, but he knows that the state needs him and he knows that he's the most qualified and he knows that he has the skills to make the state prosperous. So what does he say? He states that he states his good qualities. There's no shame in doing so because you're not doing with the intention to show off. You're doing with the intention to benefit, to benefit others. There's nothing wrong with that Islamically. Rather, sometimes it becomes obligatory to, for you to do that. For instance, I'll give you an example. When it comes to salah, when it comes to the prayer, who has the most right to lead the prayer? Huh? Who has the most right? The one who has the most what? The, mo the one who has the most knowledge of the Quran, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, That the one who possesses the most knowledge of the Quran should lead the people in salah, right? Okay, let's say you come into a random masjid and the imam of the masjid is not there. And then everyone is looking at each other who should lead the prayer. And you are half of the, of the Quran, right? In that situation, should you just stand back and say, pretend to be humble? Or are you required to step up if you do not know if there's any other half amongst them? In that situation, you are required to step up and lead the people in prayer. Because imagine someone else leads the people in prayer who is making major mistakes in Fatiha. That can invalidate the people's salah. Who is responsible, responsible for that? You, because you didn't step up. Does that make sense? So certain situations, it is required for an individual to step up and say that they're qualified. There's nothing wrong with that. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're being arrogant or being boastful, right? Yusuf alayhi salam, who's a prophet of Allah, he did that. Okay, he is made the treasurer. When Yusuf alayhi salam becomes the treasurer, a while later, his brothers, they eventually come to Egypt. And when they come to Egypt, they are at the mercy of their brother Yusuf, who they plotted against. When they come to Yusuf alayhi salam, and they are seeking some goods to take back to their home, right? Yusuf alayhi salam, they see him. And then when they see him, and they ask and they make a request from him, what do they say to him? They say to him, 
إنا نراك من المحسنين. When their brother, he put something in his, their brother Benjamin to make it seem like that he's stolen something, right? We see you from those who do good, etc. Look, Yusuf alayhi salam, he has now a position of power. They don't know who he is. He is in a position of power, of authority. But despite being in a position of power, when he was in prison, it was said to him, Inna naraka min al muhsinin. When he was in the well and after he came out of the well, Allah said, Wa kadalika najlil muhsinin. Each time Allah describes Yusuf as from those who do good. Even when he was in a position of power and authority, what does that teach us? That when Yusuf granted, was granted power, authority, that did not take, change him. Some people, when they are granted a position of power, etc., they completely change. They start treating people badly. They start acting arrogant. They look down on others. They start uh, being those who are evil and interacting with people with bad titles, this, this power, this position did not change him. It did not change his nafs. Rather, he remained the same, despite that. Because when someone is attached to Allah, and one is a true slave of Allah, they know that this world is temporary. That it's going to eventually end. These positions that you're granted, this power, these titles, they are going to come to an end, and you're going to be held accountable your al qiyamah. Therefore, they never were attached to it. And that's how we need to be. Don't let the dunya change you. Don't let the wealth and all this change you. Don't let it change your nafs. Don't become one who's attached to it. Rather, be one. Even if you possess a lot of wealth, even if you grant a status, whatever it may be, be one who only has these matters in his hands and it does not enter his heart. Later on in the story, Yusuf alayhi salam, he keeps behind his brother Ibn Yameen. He stays behind with him. And now the brothers, they go back again. They lost another brother. Ya'qub alayhi salam, he is in a state of misery and sorrow and sadness, extreme sadness. And then when he finds out that his other son is also missing, he's afflicted with even more grief. But he only complains to Allah, no human being. He said, Innama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah wa a'lamu min Allah ma la ta'lamun. He said, I only complain my sorrow, my grief, my sadness only to Allah, no one else. I'm not going to complain to human being. And I know that you do not know. With that last statement, I know from Allah that which you do not know, it is Ya'qub alayhi salam showing that he's hopeful. He has not lost hope. He is still clinging on to that hope. He is not in a state of despair. But he's also teaching us that this grief and sorrow he's feeling is natural. And every human being will go through it. Ummuna Aisha radiallahu anha wa ardaha when Haditha ifk happened and she was being slandered by the Munafiqeen that spread a rumor in Medina that she had uh, had relations with another man. So they spread this evil rumor about her and she's sad. She's going through this difficult time. Everyone's talking about it. People believe it and the Prophet والسلام, does not know whether it's true or not and he said to her, Ya Aisha, if you have done this, then seek forgiveness from Allah. He said to her, and if you have not done this, then Allah will prove your innocence. Even Ali said to her, if you have done this, if there's a possibility, and she knows she's certain that she's innocent, and she cried, and she was so emotional that she says that I say what Abu Yusuf said. She couldn't remember his name, Yaqub alayhi salam. That I complain my grief, my sadness only to Allah Azza wa Jal. That's how the believer is. The believer does not complain to human beings. The human beings cannot do much for you. But when you complain to Allah, that's strength. But when you complain to human beings, that's a weakness. 
complaining to human beings, that's a weakness. But when you complain to Allah and you cry to Allah, that's strength. Because Allah, wa ta'ala, when you cry in front of Him and you raise your hands to Allah and you ask Allah for His aid and, and assistance, Allah Azza wa promises to help you and assist you. Rather, Allah wa ta'ala will strengthen you. Rather, Allah wa ta'ala will help you. Rather, Allah Azza wa will grant you way out. And Allah wa ta'ala will protect you. And Allah wa ta'ala will grant you that which you seek. But it's a matter of being one who turns to Allah, not the creation of Allah. Yusuf, uh, Yaqub alayhi salam, he sends his sons to go search for Yusuf and his brother. He says, تَحَسَّسُ مِنْ يُوسُفُ وَأَخِي And then what does he say? Listen to this statement. وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ He says, and do not despair from the mercy of Allah. Hope. Cling on to that. Because he says, verily, only those who despair from the mercy of Allah are the disbelieving people. This is a lesson, and it's very important in your kiram, that despair is the first path that shaitan uses to lead you to disbelief and misguidance. Despairing from the mercy of Allah and giving up on the mercy of Allah is one of the first traps of shaitan he uses to lead you to disbelief and misguidance. When you despair, it leads to misguidance and disbelief. Allah teaches us that do not despair, do not give up, do not want be one who despairs the mercy of Allah. The mercy of Allah, Jalla fi ula, it is great, it encompasses everything. فَسَأَكْتُبُهَا لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ Allah says, my mercy has encompassed everything. And I'm going to give it to those and grant it to those who are God conscious and establish a prayer and give for the sake of Allah. One of the salihin from the salaf, he used to say, اللَّهُمَّ ارْحَمْنِي بِرَحْمَتِكَ أَلَّتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَإِنِّي شَيْءٍ Look at that understanding. He would say, Oh Allah, grant me your, work, your mercy that has encompassed every shay for verily I am a shay thing. So grant me your mercy. Allah Ta'ala is the one who promises you from his mercy that he's going to forgive you, that he's going to grant you way out. Allah Ta'ala is going to assist you, but it's a matter of you clinging on to the mercy of Allah, asking Allah for his mercy. Allah Azza wa Jalla commands the Prophet Alayhi Salaam to tell us, نَبِّعْ عِبَادِي أَنِّي أَنَا الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَأَنَّ عَذَابِي هُوَ الْعَذَابُ الْأَلِيمُ نَبِّعْ عِبَادِي أَنِّي أَنَا الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَأَنَّ عَذَابِي هُوَ الْعَذَابُ الْأَلِيمُ Allah says, inform my slaves, O Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, that I am al-ghafoor, the oft forgiving, the one who constantly forgives again and again and again, al-raheem, the especially merciful. And inform them also that my punishment it is the severe painful punishment. Allah mentions his mercy and forgiveness for his punishment because Allah's mercy has preceded his anger as we have in the hand Qudsi وَرَحْمَتِي سَبَقَتْ غَضَبِي that my mercy has preceded my wrath and my anger Allah says and you find that that mercy is displayed at the end of the surah just before the end when the brothers of Yusuf they come to Yusuf and Yusuf السلام, and his father and his mother and his brothers, they all come. When Yusuf السلام, he exposes himself to him, to them. When they realize it's him, they seek his forgiveness. They regret what they have done. 
They said, Allah has preferred you over us. Allah has preferred you over us. Look what Allah has granted you. And look at the situation that we're in. Look at that. These brothers, they oppressed their brother Yusuf. They oppressed him. And they oppressed him for their own personal gain. But who came out on top? Yusuf السلام, and they were the ones who were in a state of poverty at his mercy. Oppression, its consequences, you will face it in this world before the hereafter. It's from the sins that the consequences of oppression, they occur in this world before the hereafter. If you oppress someone, Allah hastens the punishment of the oppression in this world before you meet Allah in the next life. Because the Prophet ﷺ tells us that oppression, it is ظلمات, darkness on the day of judgment. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us three times of people that dua, there is no veil between it and Allah. And amongst them is the mazloom, the oppressed one. His dua is accepted immediately by Allah ﷺ. There is no hijab, veil between it and Allah ﷺ. Even the kafir, the disbeliever, if he's oppressed and he makes dua to Allah, Allah will grant him victory and help and grant him a response. It's a dangerous matter. It's something that we have to be extremely wary of. In the Hadith Qudsi, the Prophet Ali narrates to us that Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Ya ibadi, inni harramtu dhulma ala nafsi. Oh my servants, oh my slaves, I have made dhulm, oppression, haram for myself, Allah is saying. And I have made it haram between you, so do not oppress one another. Allah does not oppress, and He has prohibited that we oppress one another. What month are we in? Huh? August. I don't want August. We're Muslims. Muharram. What is special about Muharram? It's the month of Allah and it is? It's a sacred month. There are four sacred months in the year. Allah Azza wa says, Inna iddata shuhuri inda Allah ithna ashara shahran fi kitab Allah yawma khalaqa samawati wal ard منها أربعة حرم ذلك الدين القيم فلا تظلموا فيهن أنفسكم. Allah says, "Verily, the months in the sight of Allah are twelve. When Allah created the heavens and the earth, and from these twelve months, they are four months that are sacred. What are they? They are the القعدة, the الحجة, محرم, الرجب." These four months are sacred months. What does Allah advise us to not do in these months? Allah says, do not oppress yourselves in these months. How do you oppress yourself? By disobeying Allah, by doing that which angers Allah, by doing that which Allah Azza wa prohibited. Allah Azza wa is telling you, be wary of disobeying Allah even more in these months. Qatada alayhi rahmatullah. He says in the tafsir of this ayah that the sins, they are multiplied in these months just like the good deeds are multiplied in these months. Scary, right? So sinning in these months is not like any other time. Even the mushrikeen of Quraysh, they used to venerate these months. They used to avoid fighting and warfare in these months because they knew they were sacred months and fighting in it is worse than any other time. So we are believers, we need to be wary of that. This bullying, this oppression that Allah Azza wa Jal, He is warning us of, it is three types. Oppression that Allah never forgives. An oppression that Allah Azza wa Jal will always hold you accountable for. An oppression that Allah Azza wa Jal may forgive you for and He may not forgive you. As for the first, which is oppression that Allah will never forgive, it is a shirku billah. Associating partners with Allah. وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِظُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ 
Luqman Hakimi said to his son, Oh my son, do not associate partners with Allah. Barely a shirk associating your partners with Allah. It is great oppression. Zulm. And Allah says about this oppression, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah does not forgive that he associates partners with him. And he forgives anything else less than that for whoever he wishes. This means that if an individual commits shirk in his life and they die upon it, يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَ Allah won't forgive you. Impossible. But if an individual committed shirk in this world and they repent whilst they're alive, Allah will forgive you, inshaAllah. We're talking about if you die upon it, Allah won't forgive you. That's the first type of dhulm. The second type of dhulm, it is dhulm that Allah will always hold you accountable for. And that is al-dhulm bayn al-ibad, oppressing the creation of Allah. It's extremely dangerous. Our relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, it is based on musamaha, tolerance and forgiveness. Allah forgives. But as for the creation of Allah Ta'ala, they are not as forgiving. If you oppress others, they may not forgive you. Rather, Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَإِذَا نُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَلَا أَنْسَابَ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ وَلَا يَتَسَاءَدُونَ When the horn is blown, when people are resurrected, يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu commenting on this ayah, Allah says there is no ties of family kin between them on that day of judgment. There's no such thing as family. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he says, Yom al-Qiyamah, the individual is going to try to get any good deed they can to save themselves from the punishment of Allah. And they are going to start with the closest people to them, their mother, their father, their brother, their sister, their family. They're going to start with them. Any wrongdoing that they have done to them, anything that they have done to them that may have harmed them in this world, they're going to try to get their right back to save themselves. Imagine that day that even the family members are trying to take good deeds from each other. So what do you think about others who are not your family? That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he warned against it severely. He وسلم, he said, Atadruna min al Do you know who the bankrupt person is? The Sahaba, they said, Ya Rasulullah, the bankrupt one is the one who has no wealth. And then he said, Ali وسلم, the bankrupt, my ummah, is the one who will come Yom Al-Qiyamah with many good deeds. But he has backbited so-and-so, he has slandered so-and-so, he has oppressed so-and-so, he stole the wealth of so-and-so. Uh, he took the rights of others, he oppressed them. And then he's taken from his good deeds and given to them. And when he has no good deeds left, he's taken from his, their sins and given to him. And then he's dragged to the hellfire, Iyadhan Billah. He's not an easy matter. This shows that no matter how many good deeds you have and how righteous you are and how much you worship Allah Ta'ala, if you transgress against the rights of others, all of that will not benefit you. Rather, all of that, you are working for others. That's what the Salaf, they said, that the most foolish individual is the one who works himself like a donkey for others. He is praying salah, he is giving charity, he is doing so many good deeds, but he's transgressing and oppressing against others. He is working for them and giving all those good deeds to them. For free. It's foolish. So Allah Ta'ala, He will always hold you accountable for this unless that person forgives you. And the last type of oppression, it is the sins that you commit between you and Allah. Transgressing against the rights of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal, if you do not repent from it in this world, Allah Yawm Al-Qiyamah may forgive you or He may punish you. You are Tahta Al-Mashi'a under the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. These are the three types of oppression that Allah warns us from. Oppression is not an easy matter. We have to take it seriously. This is what we are being told to be wary of even more in these months. So the brothers of Yusuf Alayhi Salaam, because they oppressed him, that was the consequences that they faced. But look at Yusuf Alayhi Salaam, this noble soul. How does he respond to his brothers? Allah <laughs> 
يغفر الله لكم وهو أرحم الراحمين. He said there's no blame upon you. لا تثيب عليكم اليوم. يغفر الله لكم. Allah will forgive you. He's given them hope that Allah will forgive. I've forgiven you and Allah will forgive you. Allah Azza wa Jalla grant you His forgiveness. That's Allah Azza wa Jalla. He's given them that hope in the forgiveness of Allah because Allah Tabarak wa Taala tells in the Hadith Qudsi that the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrates to us, "Ya Ibn Adam, لو بلغت ذنوبك عنان السماء." If your sins they reach the heavens because of how much you have sinned, and then you seek forgiveness from Allah Tabarak wa Taala. غفرت لك على ما كان منك ولا أبالي. Allah says, "I will forgive you," and I don't mind. Allah wants to forgive you. يا ابن آدم أو صار ابن آدم لو أتيتني بقراب الأرض خطايا. If you come to me with the size of the earth of sins, ثم لقيتني لا تشتك بشيء. And you come to me, not associate any partners with me. I'll come to you with the same size of the earth in forgiveness. That's Allah. Allah will forgive you. It's just a matter of asking Allah for that forgiveness. Yusuf is teaching his brothers, I have forgiven you and Allah will forgive you. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Ask Allah to grant you that forgiveness because Allah will forgive you for what you have done. Allah wants to forgive you as long as you ask for his forgiveness because Allah does not want to punish us. ما يفعل الله بعذابكم إن شكرتم وأمنتم وكان الله شاكرا عليما. What is Allah going to get out of punishing you? If you are grateful and you believe, you are grateful by worshiping Allah and you believe in Allah عز وجل, then Allah عز وجل does not want to punish you. That's what Allah, He clearly states in the Quran, Allah wants to grant you Jannah. He is calling you to that Jannah. Wallahu yad'u ila dari salam wa yahdi man yasha'u ila siratim mustaqim lilladhina ahsanu al-husna wa ziyadah ولا يرهق وجوههم قتر ولا ذلة أولئك أصحاب الجنة هم فيها خالدون. الله says Allah is calling to the home of peace and He guides whoever He wishes to a straight path. Those who do good. For them is Al-Husna, Jannah wa Ziyadah and more. They get to see the face of Allah. The greatest reward in Jannah. Allah is calling to that. But it's a matter of you responding to the call of Allah Azza wa Jal. The story of Yusuf alayhi salam. If we summarize it in one statement, I would say the following. That Yusuf alayhi salam, the reason why Allah wa ta'ala constantly saved him and Allah constantly protected him. And Allah granted him the goodness of this world. And Allah made him victorious. It is because Yusuf from the beginning to the end, he was attached to Allah and sincere to Allah. That is the fruit of being sincere to Allah and connected to Allah. And having full reliance upon Allah. Jalla fi ula. When you are one who relies upon Allah and you're sincere, Allah Azza wa Jalla will protect you and Allah wa will help you. Because Shaitan, Iblis, he made a promise. He said when he was expelled from the heavens, قَالَ فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ He said, Oh my Lord, I am going to, he said, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ with your might, Ya Allah, I am going to misguide them all. That's his goal. But there's an exception, those who are protected by Allah, except the sincere slaves of Allah. Those who are sincere, they are protected from the plot of shaitan. Yusuf alayhi salam, he was being plotted by, against by shayateen al-insi wal-jinn. But because of his sincerity, Allah azza wa jalla saved him. Allah Azza wa will do the same for you as long as you're one who is connected to Allah 
and you are one who's sincere to Allah and prove relies upon Allah whilst coming with the necessary means to protect yourself and to help yourself and to do that which it takes to get to your goal. If you do that, Allah will save you. Yunus alayhi salam, he was in a difficult situation. He was in the darkness of the night, the darkness of the sea, the darkness of the stomach for the well. If you're in a situation like that, you would despair, you would give up, you would think I'm going to die here, you would prepare for your death. There's no way for you to communicate with others. There's no way that you can get to others. But Yunus alayhi salam, he knows that Allah, Jalla fi ula, he hears him. He knows that Allah Azza wa Jalla sees him. He knows that Allah is aware of his situation. He says, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka, inni kuntu min al He says, there's no deity except you, Allah. Verily, I'm from the transgressors, the oppressors. What does Allah say? We responded to him straight away after that. Straight after that. And we rescued him. We saved him from the difficulty he was in. And then look at this. The glad tidings to us. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah says, and like that, we shall rescue the believers. If you do what Yusuf a.s. did, and what Yusuf a.s. did, and what all the prophets and the messengers they did, that they were those who are connected to Allah, who held them to Allah, they called upon Allah, they sought the assistance of Allah, they cried out to Allah, and they had reliance upon Allah, and they were sincere to Allah, Allah will rescue you as well. Allah will save you in the most difficult situations. But you know what exactly saved you in this alayhi salam? And they will save you as well? Allah tells us precisely what it was. فَلَوْلَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ لَلَبِثَ فِي بَطْنِهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Allah says, if he was not from those who glorified Allah, who exalted Allah, who worshipped Allah, who prayed to Allah in times of ease, when things were going well, he worshipped Allah Azza wa Jal, if he didn't do that, he would have remained in the stomach of the whale until Yom Al-Qiyamah, Allah says. If he wasn't from the one, those who did what Allah obliged him to do, he prayed his salawat, he did that at all times. In times of ease and in difficult times, if he didn't do that, he would have remained in the stomach of the whale until Yom Al-Qiyamah. So when you worship Allah in times of ease and you remember Allah in times of ease and you are one who fulfills his responsibilities to Allah Azza wa in times of ease, Allah Ta'ala will remember you in times of difficulty. As the Prophet Alayhi Salaam to Salaam, he says, Ta'arraf ila Allahi fi rakha Ya'arifka fi shidda No, I remember Allah in times of ease. And Allah will remember you in times of difficulty. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who hear this speech and follow the best of it. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who worship Him in times of ease and fulfill their obligations to Allah in times of ease. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us. We ask Allah Azza wa to protect us from all fitan, the apparent ones and the hidden ones. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge and to make us from those who act upon their knowledge. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to grant us his mercy. And we ask Allah Jalla fi ula to forgive our parents and to have mercy upon our parents. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala to grant us taqwa and to accept our deeds and we ask Allah Jalla fi ula to grant us sincerity in our statements and actions and we ask Allah to make us from those who truly rely upon him and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us from all the evil that surround us and to protect us from the punishment of the hellfire and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us his pleasure and we ask Allah Jalla fi ula to make us from those who call others towards goodness. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us sincere repentance before we die. And we ask Allah Jalla fi ula to grant us a good end. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala to keep us steadfast upon religion. And we ask Allah wa ta'ala, just like he gathered us here this evening, that he gathers us in Jannah til firdaus al-a'la with our parents and our loved ones and all those who have rights upon us without any previous punishment or any difficult account. Inna huwa li thalik wa al-qadir alayhi wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khair for listening so attentively.